All right, guys, I think we're going to be back. Uh, what time do we have to get About 10 o'clock. I think we're out of here about 11 30. Um, then again, if we do have time today, I got to take close the podium. Uh, we will go back out here and fly in the back corner. Uh, for some reason, if we don't have time to fly today, uh, this morning session, uh, more than happy to stay over a little bit this evening and go over actual real time map off the uh, tablet out there. Uh, we do have our live streaming up finally for the uh, Air Topo site. If you guys want to do that, um, for those that are online, welcome. Um, this is my first time to stream, so um, bear with me in the audience and bear with me online as well. Uh, appreciate appreciate him coming to talk about the FAA regulations. Uh, now we're going to dive off into uh, what you guys are more interested. Uh, a little bit about my background. I've been surveying since about 19 years old, been licensed for a while. Uh, a lot of you guys in here, I grew up with a, a lot of you guys, you've seen me from uh, 19, I'm almost turning 42. Uh, we started sur uh, surveying with drones about five years ago. Uh, we started out building stuff in the, in the garage. Uh, nowadays, drones uh, really come a long way to turnkey and buying stuff off the shelf, uh, making the collection a whole lot easier than it used to be. Um, software, we're going to go over a lot of software. Um, but then again, I kind of told you guys this morning, we did this speech about two years ago. Um, we're going to kind of iterate. Some slides are going to be um, from two years ago, but the majority of it's going to be uh, new and fresh. Uh, I do apologize on my public speaking. I'm a surveyor at heart, so uh, we are working on it. Uh, I do speak a lot. We've been all over the United States doing a lot of speech, speaking and lecture. Um, you've probably seen the previous slide. Uh, we're getting pushed more into training. Um, I've got people contacting me all over the world about different aspects to how do we get to the finished deliverables. Um, so we're going to have that air topo training uh, up and running hopefully in about 60 days tops. Um, we're going to have that set up where uh, I don't like to sit and listen to somebody talk for, for three hours. So we're going to have those videos set up where they're going to be anywhere between five to 15 minutes tops. They're going to be categorized. <laughs> that way you guys are able to get online for a specific problem, find that in the directory, click it and watch that video. Um, but anyway, that being said, let's go ahead and get started. On that point of training, can you get us credits online for continuing I'm, I'm, uh, I was kind of, my videos were working earlier today, you guys, I'm telling you. Um, I'm working, I'm bringing a guy in, I'm not a uh, graphics kind of guy, about, I'm not sure why my videos are working. Um, cause I have to be able, we have to be able to document the PDH hours. So we're, I'm, we're bringing a guy in more technical than I am. Um, we're going to have to set up some kind of quiz at the end of each, each session or um, somehow to document the hours. But yes, definitely want to get the PDH development hours. That way we appeal to the general public for learning and then also for, um, for your PDH hours. And I was kind of talking to a gentleman earlier about, there we go talking to a gentleman earlier about it. When I was doing all this, guys, it was all self-taught. So it was really hard for me to document all these hours to, you know, to legally turn it in for the, uh, the PDHs. Um, I'd like to start out with a little something funny, guys. Uh, be, be aware of your surroundings. <laughs> you know, uh, we, we did have an incident I told you about earlier. Uh, the police, local police were called. Um, obviously, this guy is a little more aggressive. Uh, swiped the drone out of the sky. So be aware of your surroundings, be aware Who's around you? Um, I do. Uh, FAA now requires you to fly with one person by yourself, um, but I always fly with two people. Um, that way, if something happens, guys. It happens very quickly. Uh, for your home builders, um, this happens. To, uh, this does happen. Uh, calibration. Uh, for you guys who think about wanting to build a drone, uh, it takes a little bit of time to get everything calibrated just right. So you're flying around, doing some mapping, doing some video work. A bird, guys, comes and knocks you out of the sky. Um, we've been pretty fortunate. I've had a bird, one bird made me nervous. But we have never had hit a bird yet. I'll knock on some money. <laughs> Got a lot of money invested. That water isn't so cold, we need to catch that drone. <laughs> so he's dropped his controller in the water. Yeah. Uh, kind of going back to flying over people. Um, I don't do a lot of or, or any 
recreational kind of filming events. Uh, we are strictly professional as far as engineering and surveying. Um, but know your drone, make sure things calibrated. The last thing you want to do is, you know, wipe somebody out. Uh, wildlife, guys, kind of goes back to this common sense. <laughs> Stay away from the wildlife. Be safe distance. Uh, my dog loves lasers, anything that moves. Um, early days, she got bit pretty pretty good by the propeller on a smaller prop, so she's learned to stay away. But yeah, be, just be aware. Be aware of what's going around you, for sure. Obstacles, guys. If in doubt, hit the throttle up. I tell everybody, stop and hit the throttle straight up. That's probably your safest move. If you come straight down, Obviously, there's no aircraft or something in the way you want to come down, but if you see an obstacle in the way, stop, hit that throttle straight up. And this is maybe a little risque, but this is what people think we do. <laughs> we get this all the time. Like, oh, I know you're going to spy on my neighbor, you're going to spy on this and that. So I tell everybody, as long as if you're not writing me a check, you won't see my drone. We're out there to make money, we're trying to keep everything professional. Um, but I thought that was pretty funny because I don't know how many times I've been sitting around talking to people and like, well, if I see a thing, I'm going to shoot it down. Well, I hope you do, because that's the best publicity you ever give me, honestly. Because as he said before, it's, it's registered as an aircraft at this point. We do have authorization. So if you shoot me down, uh, you're more than likely going to be the one in trouble. And it's going to do, you know, good publicity, bad publicity, still publicity is my part. OK, uh, let's kind of go over some things we did. I uh, talked about two years ago with the some newbies. How many of you guys in here are flying drones right uh, currently? How many are doing uh, topo or mapping currently? Awesome, awesome. Anybody using LiDAR with the drones? Okay. Awesome. So you kind of see where two years ago those hands were pretty minimal. Now they're starting to go up. Um, obviously the LiDAR is still down. We'll kind of touch base on that here in, in, in a few. Um, OSD and telemetry, he kind of went over that a little bit. OSD and telemetry is really nice, guys. Um, then again, you know, these new packages almost come in inclusive with the OSD and telemetry. Um, I, it's very important on my part that we have to um, be able to see that on the screen, laptop, smart device. Uh, and, you know, I want to see the orientation. It's going to tell me the north-south uh, displays the horizontal, the horizon. Horizontal. So it displays the horizon for us. Um, battery monitor, uh, satellite count, um, batteries, guys. I uh, probably can't talk enough about that. Know your drone. Go out there and fly, test it. Do some flight times. Don't run those voltage down. Um, the batteries are different from your typical batteries you put in your flashlight. Uh, when your flashlight battery dies, the light gets dimmer and dimmer until it's dead. Excuse me, when your, uh, when your lipos or your drone batteries die, they're hot and dead. They're, they're, hard, they're just not forgiving. When they're done, they're done. Uh, I've only crashed one time, and it's because I pushed that battery too far. Uh, we were coming around the corner, things started to descend. It's like, I can make it, I can make it. That last little leg, uh, obviously we did not make it. <laughs> so know your batteries, guys. Um, flight modes, OSD, it's very important to know what flight modes are in. Um, GPS, you know, adding mode, GPS mode, manual mode. There's a switch on there. We can definitely switch different modes. Um, it's important to know uh, what mode you're in, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, altitude, very important. You know, FAA doesn't want to go over 400 feet, so keep monitoring that altitude at all times. And we want to be able to see that speed. Um, when you're out there flying for fun or inspections, obviously we're hovering around, but um, we would definitely want to know the speed that we're mapping at. Um, there's some technical issues if you fly too fast. Um, flying slow is great, but obviously you burn more battery. So we're pushing that speed limit all the time. Um, anything you want to display on there about that drone can be displayed. And kind of give you a little video here of, of a uh, display. You got the latitude, longitude, uh, battery bolts are going, uh, the number of satellites. I'm not used to seeing it on the screen. You see, you know, he's in GPS mode, you can see the horizon, your heading. Um, so very, very customized, guys. You can customize this to what you want. Um, these guys are FPV. I got this from a friend that's also that runs FPV, that flies around in uh, races. Uh, obviously, I don't need all of this. I'm mainly concerned about altitude, speed, um, the horizon, and the battery. Um, then again, guys, this is your speech. This is your time. I feel honored to bring me in. Um, so definitely stop me and ask questions. Don't wait till the end, because uh, I'll we'll lose, maybe somebody else in the audience has the same question. Uh, flight controllers, guys. Uh, flight controllers have brought drones to what they are today. Uh, you know, back in the old days, we spend six months building a, a plane and then three minutes of crashing it. 
Um, with, the, with the new brain's flight controllers, um, we're able to have the GPS and the waypoints and what they are. Uh, many, many different types of brains out there. We'll go over the two most popular in a minute. Um, depending on your application, if we're mapping, if we're just doing photography, um, if you're doing uh, drone racing or sport, um, depends on what kind of brain you want to put in there. Um, the one on the back table is a Pixhawk. Um, for your home builders, I recommend Pixhawk completely. They come out with Pixhawk 2. Um, integrates very nice with Linux for all you uh, nerdy guys out there. Um, Pixhawk, P-I-X, Hawk. H A W K. Here's some examples of the kind of the popular brains out here. We got the, uh, the top two, uh, the DJI, the A2 brain is kind of the newest brain at this point. Um, the NASA, that's kind of what that's what I started out at. Um, the NASA, I believe they've got a newer NASA out at this point. It's pretty limited. Um, these are the this is the one I do recommend uh, for your home builders. If you don't want it to buy one off the uh, buy off the shelf. That if you go to a smaller company that builds them, they're more than likely going to have a fixed cost. Uh, and then the uh, Android Pilot, um, that's mainly for your FPV racers. A lot of sport, different modes that you can fly in. IMU, guys, IMU is very important. Um, initial measurement unit uh, measure, measures all movement, orientation, and magnetic fields. Very important to calibrate this. This IMU is very important, on the, especially the GPS. If your IMU is not calibrated correctly and your, your drone, helicopter, or fixed wing tilts, the IMU is going to be able to tell it to go back straight. So obviously we want the IMU calibrated because if we, if we that plane to tilt, wind, whatever is knocking it off course, um, at its orientation, we want that IMU to, to be able to correct its position. Uh, data link. Uh, data link is very important for mapping. We have to have it for mapping. Um, makes communication between the ground station and the drone possible. Um, they run in two spectrums, 900 megahertz and 433. The 433s are going to have to have require a um, hand license, so be aware of that. Uh, if you do have a hand license, it's not very hard to get. You don't. Um, I recommend the 433s because it's a stronger, safer. The, the wavelength's longer than the 933s um, or 900s. Uh, needed for autonomous flight, able to send commands. That's that's the link that sends the commands. It's basically walkie-talkies from the drone to your laptop or your uh, your uh, smartphone or smart device. The gimbal guys, um, for mapping, I know a lot of you guys are here for mapping or inspection work. Um, back in the old days, man, we just slapped the camera on there and put some vibration mounts and went to town. And we ran right into a lot of problems with blurry pictures, pictures not coming out right, um, vibrations were interfering with the camera. Now the gimbal, the gimbal's come a long way. Um, two types, two types of gimbals. We've got a brush gimbal and servo gimbal. You don't see too many servo gimbals anymore. Everything's pretty much brushless. It makes it nice and smooth. Um, the old servo gimbals kind of remind me of the old uh, RC cars and the gears. It's really very, very limited. Um, two axes, basically up and down gimbal. The, the gimbals were put their camera in. I'll show you a picture over here in a minute. I gotta, I gotta mute my, my volume here. Uh, three axis gimbal, up and down, left and right. Basically, the three axis gimbal, three axis. Um, the bigger copter in the back, we just have two axis gimbal. It's set up for mapping. I don't have it set up for filming. A lot of filming, the drone's facing this way. When I turn the camera, we don't have to turn the whole ground. drone. The three axis will turn the gimbal itself. Uh, here's a picture of uh, brushless versus servo. You can tell the brushless has a nice, smooth motor, if you will. The, the servo is a more old school kind of uh, gear driven. Um, these are nice if you're on a budget. You can build a pretty nice little bitty drone for about $200 now. Uh, here's a short video on how a gimbal operates for those who don't know. Um, obviously it's a handheld gimbal, um, but it's, it's come a long way guys. Uh, the gimbals have, um, I think the Osmo came out now. You can hook up your smartphone to it. You can run with it. I mean anybody with a small budget can almost become a, a professional photographer if you will. Uh, ground station uh, controls the drone from the controls the drone from the ground, able to send command commands to the drone, um, flight recorder, laptop, smartphone. Um, kind of going back to what uh, we were talking about earlier on the keeping records, uh, my laptop or my uh, tablet or even the drone will record that flight pattern. Um, when you do a mapping, um, you definitely have to have a ground station. Um, obviously, if you guys are just out there flying around, you can just fly off of the 
the, the controller and the drone. <laughs> but for mapping, we definitely have to have a ground station. And this one is pretty nice setup. My ground station is my, my laptop right here. But uh, for these guys that have a bigger budget, those are really, really nice. Um, anyway, going back to the three innovations making it possible for me to come and talk to you about mapping today. Um, the flight controller, the brain, um, smaller, more reliable GPS pucks. Uh, I had a gentleman come and talk to me a minute ago about, um, and his, the other guy's question was, you know, how straight does that thing fly? These GPS pucks are getting better and better all the time, guys. Um, the very first ones, we had a lot of drift, a lot of movement, um, including down to the PPK stuff, which we'll get into in, in just a minute. Uh, and the camera gimbal. Um, kind of like I tell you, we, we used to just basically zip tie a camera to the bottom of the drone and go fly. Now the gimbal's keeping it nice and steady. We can go faster and longer more proficient. Uh, two types of drones, he kind of covered a little bit earlier. Um, fixed wings and, and multi-rotors, the two most common at this point. Fixed wings, a couple examples. Oops. I fly this one here, we have that in the office. Um, this one down here, I do have the kit. It's a pretty, pretty nice little drone. Anyway, a couple examples of fixed wings. Um, pros and cons about fixed wings, longer flight times. At this time, we were doing 45 minutes. Um, now they're pushing an hour, hour and a half flight times on these uh, fixed wings. Uh, up to, even up to, I've seen, uh, I was talking to a colleague or a friend in California, he's up to two hours almost on his flight time to the fixed wings. They're lighter, they foam, and depending on a typical fixed wing, um, obviously he's talking about building a, a, a giant fixed wing to carry the payload. They're going to be uh, lighter, or lower payloads, um, affected by the wind. Um, when we're uh, flying that grid, guys, we, we have to stay pretty true to that grid because we have to keep those fixture overlaps. Um, where they need to be. Um, we are here in Oklahoma. The wind never stops, it seems like. So I fly the majority of the time a fixed wing. Um, when I go out and do a job, I want to be able to fly that pattern, know that I got it, and go home and process it. I don't want to go home and process it and see a hole because the, the drone came offline. Uh, limited payload, not good for video pixtures. Uh, the reason I put that on there is your fixed wings are constantly moving. We need that still shot. Obviously, we need to hover. Uh, don't stop when you want them to. I put that on there because the, uh, back in the days when we used to build the, uh, you know, the RC planes, like I said, you spend six months to a year building that thing and five minutes crashing it. You let go of the joysticks, it's still going to go towards the, the you know, the dugout back fence. And um, with the, with the multi rotors, if something should happen, I'll tell you in that video, uh, let go of the sticks. It's going to drift a little bit, but it'll stop and you're able to recover. Um, harder to launch and land. Um, you're going to have to have some kind of room to launch and land these. There's lots of different uh, applications to launch these things from you know, rubber, bat, rubber band slingshots to manually taking off to throwing the poor thing to catching them with a net. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit more intense to take that thing off and land it. Um, they are good for long range. So these things will stay up for a long time. Um, going back to the FAA, we do have to keep visual line of sight, um, but they will, will go further than a multi rotor. Uh, multi rotors, the most popular brand right now. Uh, DJI, DJI is just really crushing the market. Um, that's probably the most popular. Uh, I put this on here uh, two years ago. This was pretty cool. Uh, I was talking to a gentleman a minute ago that they've actually got one smaller, compact, and nicer, and then they've launched it in testing it in China for drone taxis. Um, it's coming, guys. I don't know if it's going to be 10 years or 50 years, especially in the United States. Seems like we're a little uh, less progressive, but. Um, they do have stuff up and running for a human being can jump in one of these and be transported somewhere else. Anyway, pros and cons about multi rotors: um, 10 minute to 30 minute flight times. Um, then again, guys, know your flight times. Talk to your manufacturers. Um, just because the manufacturer says 30 minutes, that means you're coming out of the air in 30 minutes. Um, I, I fly the D, uh, DJI Phantom 4 Pro, and they do have 30 minute flight times, but we do fly about 20 minutes because at 30 minutes. I want, I want that extra buffer, number one, if something should happen. Um, but then again, going back to those batteries, when they're done, they're done. And when they say 30 minutes, 30 minutes means you're probably picking it up off the ground. Um, they're pretty easy to learn to fly, especially with the GPS. I, I still, when we sell these things, we do encourage our clients to buy smaller ones. <coughs> Excuse me, and learn how to fly manually. Things do happen. If you lose GPS signal orientation, you should be able to take that over to manual mode and bring it back home safely. Um, better payloads. Obviously, we can stick any, just about anything you want under a drone. I'm kind of telling the cameras have come a long way. Um, the multi spectral cameras, I used to be around five pounds. And uh, I just saw one on uh, 38 Events website. 
you know, it's about, about a pound for five different sensors on the camera. It's pretty cool. Uh, best for video, obviously we're going to hover, we can get that shot, we get in close, we can take our time, run an object stability. Um, they're all GPS guided, guys. I can take that drone for you guys to know. If it's hovering, I can drag it, let go, and it'll go right back to its, its uh, position, position hold. Um, stop when you want it to, able to control the motor failure. Depending on the setup, uh, sorry, the white phantom propeller, if the prop does not on it, you're coming down. The one we have back there that has the dual props, or you've seen some copters that have the six <laughs> arms, the eight arms, you can lose a motor and still make it home. Um, so be aware of that when you guys are purchasing your drone or looking into it. And then launch and land anywhere. Um, we just did a job on Grand Lake um, for uh, Terracon, and we actually launched from the uh, pontoon. So it was pretty interesting. So you can launch these things just about anywhere you want. I guess I should have turned up all my ads. To uh, drone uses. Now we're going to kind of get into what you guys are probably interested in. Photography and videography or video are probably the most popular. Obviously everybody kind of knows about that. Construction management, inspection, search and rescue, mapping, topographic thermal, and pun is intended, sky's the limit here. Um, what I tell everybody else, I give a lot of speeches for different groups, is that you guys know your career or your business better than I do. Um, obviously, we can build the drone, we can tell you how to fly it, but as far as knowing your job, I know we're all sort of engineer, engineers here, but you guys might think of a hundred different applications than I do. Um, so, definitely can get creative. Uh, photography, um, we just said we, we mainly do for uh, surveying engineering. Um, this picture was taken. A uh, poor lady didn't want her donkeys crossing the creek, getting it dirty, so she filled it up. Um, one of the engineers gives us some uh, litigation because of the bean field at the south of it. Obviously, damming up, flooding up the bean field. Um, we get some attorneys involved, so we went out there and took some shots. Um, typically, you know, we run atop a bank or a topo and turn it in, um, but the picture is kind of worth a thousand words, if you will. So, again, you know, just, just be creative about how, you, about how you're going to use your drone to better um, serve, your, uh, serve your daily work. Anyway, here's a video of it. So now, now we took a picture, but now I have a video of it as well. Construction management. <clears throat> it kind of goes back to a picture worth a thousand words. This is a building over in Stillwater. Um, so you have out-of-state investors, and then you can see the action of what's going on. You can go up there and take a nice shot. It's a whole lot easier than going down from the ground or trying to get from a building. Um, take the shot. Great documentation. Speaking of documentation, daily reports, um, especially you guys, pipeliners, uh, the daily reports are and I hammer you guys for those every day. Um, this would be a great supplemental. Uh, I've been on some jobs with the field engineers fudge the pipe for that day. You can't fudge um, a picture. Inspections, um, this is our bird in the air. Um, the gentleman out of uh, Rhode Island, Andy Trench, the exact sense. Um, this kind of goes back to LIDAR. LIDAR is not quite there for large mapping guys. Inspection work, great. Stuff on tower bridges, small areas, LIDAR is going to be your, your ticket. Uh, here's a point cloud from the uh, from the uh, cell phone tower. Uh, we had the pleasure of doing windmills a couple years ago. And if you guys weren't here before, you probably saw this video. It was really fun for about two days. About the third week, it was it was work. Um, but just want to come on to show you. Typically, they'll do about two a day. Some poor guy will climb the tower, repel down the blade, turn the blade, climb the tower, not repel down the blades. How they're doing their current inspections. Obviously, with drones. Um, they're replacing those poor climbers. Um, we were knocking out between eight to ten windmills a day, depending on you know the windy days or speed or whatnot. And kind of to show you the resolution we were getting here. It's, I mean, you can put some awesome different cameras with zoom lenses. I think we're using 100 times zoom lens. I can't remember. We're using the big copter. Um, the field engineer was very nervous. Obviously, one windmill blade costs around. I think, $250,000 to replace. So obviously those guys get a little bit nervous, especially with that bigger drone flying around the carbon glass blade. We have to stay outside the blade. So you can, and the blades are about two, 300 feet, I believe. Uh, so you kind of see the resolution you can be able to pick up. You guys have any questions? Real, real quiet out here. What's the lightest weight LIDAR unit you're aware of? The pup alone is going to weigh five or seven pounds. The whole thing, is about 10 to 12 pounds for the, the, the LiDAR set. And that's where the flight time 
looked into. Um, and we'll, at the end of the session, I'll talk more about LIDAR, um, just because it's, the, I thought FODAR, we'll get into that in a minute. FODAR is more popular than LIDAR at this point, but I'll, I'll definitely go through a whole LIDAR session here in just a second. Um, are your battery readings, you know, 30 minutes or 45 minutes, is that an empty load or full load? Well, oh, well, it, it, well, yeah, it's definitely, uh, sorry, I was trying to <coughs> we come from. Um, your flight times, your battery times, it's kind of like a teeter totter, guys. We want to find that nice balance between flight times and payload. Obviously, we start adding weight, we get less flight time. Take away weight, and that kind of goes with batteries, too. Like that bigger drone, we'll run two. I wish I brought two. The batteries weigh more than the thing. Online here, but the batteries weigh more than the drone does. Um, that being said, I can stack, you know, ton of batteries on there, but my flight time is going to start decreasing. So you kind of have to find that sweet spot, um, find out what drone works best for your application. You know, am I, am I carrying a the thermal, am I carrying LiDAR, uh, what's my payload, and what do I need to, what kind of drone do I need for that payload? That answers your question. Yeah. But yeah, definitely a constant teeter-totter. I mean, the, the brand of motors make a difference. You know, T-Motors versus some stuff you buy out. Or hobby tea or something crazy. Uh, batteries are the same way, you know. You know, we uh, always try to promote tattoo batteries. I love tattoo batteries. Um, obviously, DJI has their own battery packs, but for your self-built or um, home builds, uh, we recommend tattoos. They have, they do have a shelf life. Batteries do have a shelf life. Um, they do wear out. Um, if I get on, you know, a, a local website and I order Trinity's Trinity batteries, I'm not going to get. I probably get 30 cycles um, with. Tattoo, I mean, I'm pushing probably closer to 100 cycles. These are all lithium ion uh, polymer. Yes. Uh, inspection work, guys. Um, done a lot of stuff with the oil and gas here lately. Inspection work, pump jacks. Obviously, you know, we want to see if the motor's burnt. Are we leaking uh, oil out of the hole? Um, what's really nice here, you know, they have pump jack farms. Uh, we've done not so many here in Oklahoma. Uh, what's nice about this, you know, in Oklahoma, man, those, uh, the roads to get to the pump jacks are rough. Say it's raining or something like that. Um, we can launch this thing from a county road, go check, uh, check on the pump jack or do an inspection and get back pretty quick. Um, that being said, too, and we talked to an outfit in Texas that have um, pump jack farms. Um, number one, you know, some poor guy does drive that every day. Um, if we do have a drone fixed wing, stays up longer, longer range. Um, we can actually do a quicker inspection. Number one is the pump jack working, and then we can send a technician out there. So inspections are uh, a lot of good uses for inspections. Uh, point cloud. We'll get into more point clouds in a minute. But I just want to say that we can generate point clouds, guys. Um, there's a point point cloud uh, of a pump jack here in the Oklahoma City area, on, actually. Tank farms, then again, going back to oil, or tank farms, battery tanks, uh, going back to the oil and gas. Um, number one, are we leaking anything? Number two, is our contaminant barrier? Do we have any breaches? You know, it, it's a lot easier, especially if you have multiple of these, or it's hard to get to. Uh, makes it, the drone makes it really, really nice uh, to be able to visualize what's going out there for inspection purposes. Uh, mapping, that's what the majority of us are here to talk about. Um, this is a particular map we did in Collinsville for Rural Water District. Um, drinking water, see the river coming down here, they have their sediment pond. Um, the contractor turned in $250,000 worth of over tickets for the pond. Um, and of course, you know, we got into a legal legal battle between the rural water district and the contractor. Who's going to pay for that dirt being hauled? So the uh, engineer hired us, he knew we were doing, doing drone work. We're getting down to centimeter accuracies. We could have sent a filter out here and did a top of the bank all the way around that. It's taking us a long time. We went out there, set some ground control fluid. Um, we'll get into KMZ files. I'm able to create a KMZ file. And I don't know how many of you guys have ever been in litigation. When you talk to attorneys, it's like deer in the headlights. We just do not speak the same language. Um, we did some volume reports. We turned in some nice paperwork. Uh, this went on for about a month. We went out there and flew it, took the map, made a KMZ, overlaid it. And of course, you can see all the attorneys' lights come on. Like, oh, yeah, it, it, it did mess up. So, long story short, we saved the uh, Rural Water District about $250,000 by doing, uh, doing some mapping. Uh, requirement 15, um, my bread and butter for a long time has been out the surveys. Um, we're now feeling, being able to fill that requirement 15. And you can tell the resolution and the accuracy that we're getting. 
depending on how we set up our flight plan, we're getting about 500 of accuracy on the average on the board boats. Um, that being said, guys, with traditional LIDAR, you're able to digitize right off the cloud, um, UAV clouds. I like to tell everybody UAV clouds are 85% LIDAR, 15% UAV, just, to, just enough to mess up the LIDAR software currently out there. Um, that being said, I'm kind of divulging more because we're going to be doing some more training. Uh, we use TerraSolid, and we've had to use TerraSolid because we can manipulate some of the algorithms to better handle um, UAV clouds over LiDAR flight. Anyway, uh, what's really nice, Alpha Survey, um, as you can tell before, this is a pretty big complex, really large complex. We've taken, honestly, probably about three days, maybe five days to shoot everything out. I'm talking about one man crew, guys. One man, you'll get it on run multiple crews. I can do this now in about a day, day and a half. Uh, one guy's out there doing boundary, the other guy's do, setting up control. As he's done too, the control, we have a reflectorless gun, we're shooting in the buildings, and then we're flying over the top and I'm digitizing what I call busy work. Um, we got into some apartment complex where there wasn't a straight piece of sidewalk and it'll just eat your lunch. So we can come in and I, digit, I digitize my, my busy work, um, parking. That being said, too, I don't know how many of you guys do alpha work. Uh, never fails the attorney or title company will come back two weeks later and say, hey, I need parking stripes. Well, crap. we got to send another field crew out there. You can see now we've got parking stripes. I'm able to count the parking. Stripes come up very nice. Another issue with doing a lot of alpha surveys, guys, is uh, building height requirements. I don't know how many have come back and said, I need a building height. Man, we didn't tell me that at the beginning. You got to send another crew. I'm generating a point cloud. I've got control. I've got a point cloud. I can hold any building height that I want off that point cloud. So really collecting a lot of data. And I was talking to a gentleman earlier about is that not only am I crushing the time on the Altas now, now if, if for any reason, any project that I've ever flown with ground control, I can produce that topo. I don't care if you come back five years from now, I've got that data. As long as nothing's changed, um, I can produce that topo. You're still charging extra when they uh, come back and ask for Oh, definitely, definitely, definitely. Guys, uh, a little bit about my history. I, I learned on it, the Adelaide EDM, the 41. And we, you know, we went to the total station, the Nikon, to the Topcon, to running static pods, the RTK, and now we're running drones. But that, you know, that, that being said, guys, I don't want to be that surveyor or that person just because we can do it better and a better, a better, faster and better. I don't want to cut our industry. I, run, I hope you guys don't do that either. You know, back in the day, we used to run a section for Fifteen hundred, twenty-five hundred dollars, and now we got some people out there running it for five, eight hundred bucks because they can RTK it. So please, please try to keep our income high, if you will. Don't get into a bidding or a mortgage inspection board. I grew up in the mortgage inspections as well. Um, but yeah, definitely we, we do charge. You charge the time. Um, we turn it in. I mean that's kind of my pocket secret. I'm not going to tell the title company. Oh yeah, I got that data. You know, no. I mean you guys. Still my time to process, still the time to pull it out. You should have filled out that table A that we've asked you to fill out. You failed to at first. Uh, any other questions? Pretty quiet group here. Uh, topography, guys. Um, this is an example of a topo that we did. And obviously in the presentation, guys, the PowerPoint buzzes out my, my picture. So be aware that the actual product is really crisp and clean and clear. Um, see, we got a pretty good deal going here. Pretty good drop off going for the road. Um, got a highway, meeting another highway here. Um, concert, concert turned out great. Um, we were able to. Uh, well, down here is grass, up here is trees. And then in the training, we'll get into more about how to manipulate the trees um, a little bit better. Um, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute about the limitations as far as vegetation with the, what I call photo work. But anyway, we, we did this in a day. We can fill through two or three days probably to do it. And did not picking up quite the data that we would with the drone. You know, obviously put the GPS on a four wheeler, tell we want to take a shot every 25 feet, every 50 foot. Um, when you're running LIDAR, I believe ODOT requires 30, uh, 30 points per square meter, if I'm, if I'm correct. We're running 120 points per square meter uh, with the drone. Now that sounds great, looks like a great model, but when we, when we dump it in the software, it's too much data to handle. We'll dump it down, or thin the cloud down to about 50 to 60 points per square meter. Um, that being said, traditional sponsors, guys, uh, we're trying to break into more of the LIDAR thinking, more of the futuristic, if you will. 
you know, old school, we run brake lines, the contours look great, nice and smooth. I don't know how many of you dealt with LiDAR data. LiDAR data used to be, tends to be a little more jaggedy. Um, what I tell people, a good example is one of the first projects we did um, was a nice open field, kind of had a, a, a swell or a stream, and we had a bunch of little islands, a bunch of little circles everywhere. And uh, of course the engineer called me up and said, hey, what's going on here? I said, yeah, I don't know. I mean, we're we're learning this stuff too, so I sent a field crew out there and I uh, walked out there with them. But then I realized, if I'm sending my party chief, I'm relying on my expertise to picking up that brake line. And then if you guys have ever walked down any kind of stream, you may be ankle deep, take a step, and you may be knee deep or waist deep. So it's picking up everything possible out there. So um, in five years, we've made everybody happy except for one customer. Uh, that actually happened about two, two months ago. And the only complaint that was really had is that the contours were too jagged. So there, there's a little bit of learning curve from traditional contours to more of a LiDAR. But for, the, for those who run LiDAR, um, you're aware of this already. Uh, getting the mapping. My mouth goes dry all the time, so bear with me on drinking here. Uh, mapping, guys, what do we need to do to map? We definitely have to have autonomous flights. We have to have the GPS running. Um, ground station, we need to be able to talk to that drone, upload the mission. Um, data links, we talked about that. I need to be able to talk to that drone and upload that mission to the data links. Um, precise flight lines, we kind of got into a discussion earlier. We have to make sure we fly those flight lines pretty close, uh, especially when you're running FODAR, digital photography. Um, we want to make sure our picture overlaps are set correctly. I've got a slide showing you how to interpret that. i got a question. Yes. On your overlap? Uh, on our, our program we run, we run Logan 3 for the uh, test line. Mm -hmm. uh, I run like 6 feet, 7 feet. Right. And I don't get it, right? I, I overlap as much as possible. Do you find any difference when you do that? Because it tells me overlap is impossible, but I get it too low. Or too, I overlap too much. Right, and that's where, especially with the fixed wings, yeah. fixed wings are moving. You can't hardly slow them down. I know. What's, what's really nice about the multi rotors that we're doing. Um, your overlaps. Let me let me change the slide, and we'll get into more of the overlaps and speed and, and that kind of that special formula to make it all work and the accuracies. Uh, geotagging, uh, metadata. Uh, that's stuff that we have to study for the test. The definition. It's coming back. We have to know data about data. We need to be able to right-click that photo. Uh, once I got a slide, and kind of go over the uh, the metadata about that particular picture. Um, set GPs and TCPs, guys. Um, we have to set that when we fly the drone, we stitch just off the pictures from the drone. We're going to get a, a, at best, meter accurate. Um, obviously, we want that centimeter accuracy, so we're going to lay GCPs. Um, there are some new drones coming out that run PPK or RTK. Um, for those who are not educated, uh, most of the drones out there right now are PPK. They're not true RTK drones. Um, but what I tell everybody is that we live in a, you know, a legal world. The last thing I want to do is be called in at court, and somebody asked me, well, my drone is a PPK, RTK drone, this data is correct. Well, how do you know? Our software told me. Um, even when we run PPK or RTK, I'm still going to run ground control, but instead of GCPs, now we're going to call it checkpoints, just a surety points, guys. So keep that in mind. Uh, like I said, I don't want to be that surveyor that, that just completely trusts the drone all the time. We want, we want redundancies. Um, know your batteries. Come back to that again. I keep explaining that to you because uh, what, what I tell people all the time is when a drone crashes, it's probably 90% user error. Um, we've done something wrong, we didn't calibrate something right, we didn't do a plug a battery in. Uh, quick story, we did a job in Idabel. Um, a person had passed away and donated their land, and uh, news was out there, we had the paper out there, I mean, it was a big, big publicity. I'm over there shaking, you know, nervous, trying to keep it together. Like, please launch, please everything. And we run dual batteries, long story short, me being nervous, I forgot to plug the second battery in. We take off, I'm watching the voltage drop. I mean, there's something wrong. Obviously, I brought it home. My user error, I just didn't plug the second battery in. Know your drone. Every drone set up just a little bit different. Um, payloads are different, setup designs are different. So definitely go take some time. Don't buy a drone and go out there and do a job. Go out there and spend plenty of hours with it before you actually um, go public. Last thing you want to do is something happen to you in front of your client. Um, we've done Baker Hughes. When we did Baker Hughes, we had all the wigs. They flew over to the museum. There was about four, you know, execs sitting there watching me. Last thing I want to do is um, not know my drone and how to how to take off and do the job. Um, set up safety procedures, kind of like your pre-flight inspection of the FAA. 
Um, every zone set up a little bit different. You can set up geo fences, you can set up redundancies, but the major thing, guys, if the GPS fails, I don't care what redundancies or safety procedures you set up, know how to at least fly a little bit manually, at least land it safely. Um, mapping, first thing we got to do if we get the job, obviously, go set some GCPs. Um, this is a job we did for um, Kiwit up there in uh, Pennsylvania. I mean, obviously, see, I use the Chevron or the crow's foot target, and in my training, I'll kind of get more discussion about why I use that over a typical cross or an X. Um, I believe my way, I know my way is proven that our accuracies have gone way up since we went to this uh, type of format with GCP. Uh, this is a GCP from an air, from an alpha survey we did. It's about 150 feet high. And you can see the GCP sitting right here. Uh, kind of a funny slide. <laughs> I said we're, we're moving. When we go to an alpha, we send everybody out there, let's get it done and come home. As I'm flying, my guy didn't come off the control point. We stitched right over the top of him. But you can see that, that nose hit right in the middle of my total station. Um, it was, as a surveyor, you know, we, we uh, find little things funny. They're probably not funny. This was, as we was processing, like, man, that's, I just lost that ground control point. So be aware um, where everybody's at if you have multiple things going on in your stack. Uh, mapping GCP is uh, actually my first project landfill that we did. Um, Quick story is we did this cell, new cell by hand, and uh, they came back and needed the topo of the, the cell here was closed for about five years, overgrown, and they wanted to reopen it, so we had to topo it. And you know, what better way to test the drones over a closed landfill? If it crashes there, no one's really gonna care. Um, but anyway, we had this hand, uh, already done by hand, we flew this whole site, we were to x-reference the two together, and I was sold then that the accuracies we loaded up the uh, the DTN and the Weaver and Carlson. Uh, one of did some real time staking and low tolerances. But anyway, GCPs guys will go over that in the training video as well. Um, you don't want to set these up on a the grid. There's a lot of people online, a lot of people on Facebook. Oh, just run them on a grid. It's not a grid. There's actually a little bit of thought and placement in where to put all these GCPs. Get to the slide about the overlaps. Kind of helped answer the question that was asked before. Um, really hard to explain, but hopefully a little bit of visual. You can see the flight plan that we set up for the drone. Each little dot's gonna be a picture. Front lap, as it's taking pictures, it's gonna, what's my front lap? How the picture's gonna overlap? Side lap. Side lap, front lap, I'll run it pretty high. We're going that way anyway, right? We're gonna, I'm gonna run it as fast as my camera shutter can reset. My side lap, that's where things get a little bit mixed into the formula. Who asked the question over here? Okay. This is where the side lap comes into play. Guys, the more side lap I have, that dark blue area, my, my laps get bigger, my flight lines get closer. My flight lines get closer, my battery times increase. So, like I said, you got to find that mixture of formula that works for you. And of course, you know your height, your image, um, what, how high are you? So, all this, all this formula is going to fit into how close my flight lines are, um, how my battery, how long it's going to take to fly a job. It's how I put my altitude in there, put my speed in there. Speed's important, know your camera. Um, we did a job that we had to have a high resolution for Lake Hollow there in Tulsa, doing some panel inspections on the lake, and we needed to, to really crisp and find those hair crack lines, and I couldn't get the drone, my, my uh, copter, slow enough to get the camera to reset that shutter. Um, kind of a free tidbit here is that you typically want to keep your camera at two seconds. Uh, once you start getting down to less than two seconds on your photos, your camera has a hard time resetting. Um, say we flew this job and it's supposed to have 150 photos, you get down and you have 138 just because your camera didn't set. And now you got holes, you're going to reply it again. But does that answer your question? <coughs> kind of. Kind of. Okay. So I would always set my overlaps as high if I have more than much overlap. All right, if I'm, if I'm flying, you know, say I'll go fly 100 acres, I'm going to set my front lap about 75, 80. My side lap, I never go less than 70. Um, if I'm doing alpha surveys, I want that resolution to pop. I want that um, the GSD, ground sampling distance, I want it to go higher. Um, obviously, because my accuracy is going to go up because I'm trying to digitize, uh, I'm trying to digitize um, objects or structures other than just topo and orpo. So as a, it's kind of the need, the right tool for the right job, the right, right technique for the right job, if you will. Like I said, if I'm flying the large acres, flying high, fast, minimal overlaps, we're getting the job done. If I need a really good popping ortho, my, my horizontal accuracies need to go up, um, definitely going to fly lower and slower. Another thing that comes into play is your speed of your memory card. 
Oh, yep, we can get into that too. Uh, uh, back of the car, uh, fast hurdle. We'll, uh, we'll talk about them train too. You guys, your uh, little SD cards, if you look at that U number, U1, 2, and 3, spend the money, get the U3, the right speeds. Um, we have growing pains. We, um, when you buy the Pixhawk or whatever, it comes with its own little SD card. I couldn't get that thing to write fast enough. And, you know, just trial and error and uh, growing pains, if you will. Uh, it's kind of, kind of the old saying, you get what you pay for. Um, I think we paid like $150 for that little bitty card, but it's, it's, it's worth it. Like I said, we want to be able to get a job, come home, and know that it's done. We don't want anything to, any hiccups. But laying your targets out there, how are you determining how many, how often? I mean, aren't you trying to put them in the side laps? You've got all the full coverage? On the GCPs? On the targets? Yes. I run a minimum of, uh, what, seven targets per project, minimum. Now, targets, I think I was saying before, we'll get into more of the training on where to place the targets, but elevation. You know, if I'm on like that uh, landfill, one of the uh, sides is it's about a 200 foot drop, pretty good, you know, slope to it. So I want to make sure I get my highs and my lows. What I tell people is kind of like the lunch lady hairnet. <laughs> you know, I want to pin that hairnet down <coughs> to all the deviations. And the more that I have the deviations pinned down, kind of like running brake lines, the better product I'm going to get. Uh, a lot of people, like I say, you see online and even your manufacturer are going to say, oh, put them here, here, here. I and mean, that's the standard. It's not a standard, guys. It's, it's kind of like running your topo. Every every job's a little bit different. Uh, I mean, there's some things that we run standard. We pin our four corners down, we run them in the middle. On the outside middle, it's kind of like your four corners, if you will. And then the stuff in the interior, that's where a little judgment would come into play. So you think about still shooting the utility handles or water valves and use those to incorporate them in there? Depends how high I fly. Depends how high. I mean, if I'm flying 400 feet, I can pick up manholes. Am I going to pick up water valves? Probably not. If, if I'm flying low for an alta, I mean, you've seen the resolution. We're getting down about a half inch accuracy. Um, GSD is right around probably one and a half centimeters. Um, you know, 2.54 centimeters equal an inch. Um, so I'm able to pick a lot of stuff up from the ortho, but the right technique for the right job. You know, is it worth my time flying lower, processing longer with more photos for 100 acres, 100 feet in the air? No, I'll send a crew out there and pop what I need to pop. Uh, obviously, you know, your alpha survey that's really busy, a lot of features. No, I'm going to fly low. We want all that resolution anyway. Does that answer the question a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Uh, geotagging, guys. I've met data about data. Data about data. Um, everything is, is uh, attached to that photo. If you right click and hit properties on that photo, it's going to study shutter speed, your ISO. Everything about that picture is going to be displayed in that data. Um, what we're mainly worried about is this little number right here. We need to geotag those. Um, the best example is if I had a thousand piece puzzle and I just threw it on the floor, and I told somebody, hey, put the puzzle together, man. They're going to look at every little piece and try to figure it out. Now if I had a thousand, put, thousand piece puzzle and I laid each piece out and I just told you just put it together, that's basically what geotagging is doing. Uh, when I throw this, these photos into a stitching software, if I don't have any geotagging, the software is looking at that puzzle like a pile of pieces. It's going to take a long time to figure out how to stitch all that together. With the geotagging, it's already going to line the, the pieces of the photos out correctly, and now it's just got to pull them together on the uh, geotagging. So geotagging is very, very important. And depending on what brand or software you use, um, it's how you geotag. DJI makes it really nice. Pixhop, you got to go through a couple of steps to get there. Uh, what do we got here? Uh, mapping. All right, guys, this is a Pixhawk Mission Planner uh, here in Oakland City. We did this a while back. So you can tell this is the, the ground station. Uh, you can tell the drones flying, the flight line, the garbage limits we go on, altitude, speed, battery, kind of lower, you can't see it. Um, but as that drone's flying, you can tell we launched right here. As that drone's flying, I'm, I'm maintaining the vitals at all times. Uh, I, think it I think it takes a little more heart to fly autonomous than it is to fly. Uh, like I said, photography or video. Um, when you're having full control over the video or the photography, um, your hands are on the controller the whole time. When you go autonomous, you let go, and you're trusting everything's going to work. Um, anyway, that's, the, that's kind of a screenshot of how the uh, mapping software is going to look like it's running. Okay, talking about resolutions. When you stitch, guys, you have to say you have 100 photos, and you stitch those photos, you're going to lose a little bit of resolution in your photos. But what's really nice, guys, you, you, you have the photos individually. Say a client wants to come back and say, 
you know, I really want to inspect this area. I can send them the individual photo. You can see the detail. It's about 150 feet high. You can see the detail that we're picking up. We picked up the OSU off my hat. Um, we were able to pick up the mesh in the back of my truck. You can see the, the, the different cameras, guys, researching cameras. Um, megapixels do play a factor. Um, sensor width does play a factor. Um, but be aware that you can always go back to the individual photos for more information. Stitching. Now that we collected the photos, the photos geotagged, now we go in, take it to the office, and start processing. Collecting the data in the field is pretty much user friendly anymore. It's come a long way. Um, in my opinion, processing is where it's all at. Anybody can just about go out and fly a drone and collect, honestly. Processing is going to make you or break you from everybody else. Uh, I'm going to show you some steps through Pix4D. Pix4D is our workhorse. Um, we do use some Agile soft. I'll go through those uh, softwares here in a minute. But you can tell the same thing we rendered. This is the high built up that the battery did plug in. Um, you can tell the fly line, each little green dot is a picture. Um, in the software, we can tell same plane coordinates. On the software, we can set the coordinate systems up. We'll kind of go different software, different coordinate systems here eventually. But everything about the project's being, um, you can tell through the, through the P4D. Um, same plane coordinates. Uh, here's my GSD, grand sampling distance. Um, to touch on GSD really quick, GSD, don't confuse that. Grand sampling distance, don't confuse that with horizontal or real world accuracy. Um, GSD is uh, that photo that I showed just a minute ago. When you zoom up and you've seen photos where they start pixelating out, just before the pixelation, the GSD sampling distance is between how far the distance is between the two pixels that on the picture. Now, real world accuracy is how, how much did I shoot my ground control versus the point cloud and relativity. So when you talk to your vendors, vendors really, they're salesmen. I mean, I'm trying to knock them down at all. They're just salesmen. They'll tell you, oh, GSD's great. I'm worried about the point cloud to GCP relationship more than I am GSD. Anyway, uh, 150 out of 150 photos. Um, step one, kind of telling you guys earlier, the last thing I want to do is have 150 photos in my project, get back, and now I have only 138 processed. Okay, now that we've got the uh, step one uh, photos in there, they're starting to stitch together. Each one of these little dots is a picture, and now you can see that we're generating a point cloud in the background. Um, I'm going to zoom up on that. You can see the individual photo. You can see the point cloud now coming generated. Uh, GCP, guys, like I said, uh, at best you're going to get meter accuracies without GCPs, ground control points. You can see we have a ground control point set here. As I click, uh, Pix4D calls it a rate cloud. If I pick that uh, point and the point cloud, you can tell how many pictures make up just that one point. And that's where your accuracies, I can't remember that said earlier, that's where your accuracies come together. More of these rate clouds, more of these lines you get, the tighter your photo is going to be. Um, that being said, for you guys that don't know LiDAR, um, say you have a billion points, or let's say 200,000 points in your project. Each point has that metadata again. It has latitude, longitude, or easting and northing, whatever you want to call it, and elevation. Each point is an intelligent point. Uh, example of a point cloud, uh, landfill that we did. You can tell this is water. Um, does not like water very well. So be aware of that. But raw point cloud, you have to forgive me my PowerPoint skills. I couldn't get the video to loop last night. Um, but yeah, raw point cloud, what's nice about the raw point cloud, we'll, we'll hit on this again, is that when we're doing FODAR, um, we're getting a color point cloud. For you LiDAR guys, it usually comes in the gray scale, then you put RGB colors to it. Um, which then, what's nice now, we get a nice cool color point cloud. Um, I was going to say something. Uh, <clears throat> here we go, raw point cloud. That's typically what we'll get uh, raw data from uh, a LiDAR unit. Uh, classification. I classify, I classify everything as ones and zeros. It's either ground or everything else. I'm, I'm running contours. Um, the UAV cloud, it, it really doesn't do a very good job, kind of going back to what the current software on the market doesn't do a very good job. So you want to classify buildings or, you know, classify cars or, you know, you LiDAR users, you're classifying maybe 100 different things in that project. Um, UAV is just going to be really, really tough to classify that many objects. Um, for what we do, ones and zeros, ground or not. Uh, we'll get our Earth. 
kind of going back to that relativity um, error, I'm starting to generate my GCP report. Um, here's a DSM or DTM uh, bearer. GCP report, folks, I'm going to show you my best GCP report because I'm speaking in front of you guys. But here's each GCP, puts my error on every GCP. That's my collective GCP error, about 300. Um, I, I, I do not want to go advertise that we're running 300 on everything. I'm just saying we, we hit pretty awesome on this project. Um, things like concrete, asphalt, gravel, hard surface, very minimal vegetation. Our accuracy is going to be around 500. Um, typical topo work, um, we want everything on two tenths or less on topo. I'm busting two tenths trying to figure out what's going on. Why, why did we do that? Uh, contours. Now we're going to run the contours. There's the contours for the landfill. Nice little 3D model. Once we have the bare earth, it kind of goes back into typical survey, what we've been doing for years. All right, kind of going back to the limitations of uh, FODAR. Um, my definition of FODAR, guys, is that um, we kind of have the educated versus the uneducated. Um, old school photogrammetry, say you called up the, the typical aerial and said, hey, I want a five foot contour. They go fly it out at 10,000 feet, come back and process that, give you the five foot contours. <laughs> say a year later, the project hasn't changed. They want to do a one foot contour. They have to go back out there and fly to get the one foot contour. They're, they're you know, ortho erect and doing the, the stereo. Um, so we're still taking pictures like photogrammetry, but when the client calls me and say, I need one foot contours, two foot contours, or even half of whatever I want to run, we're a, pipe, we're a point cloud. So we're in the LIDAR. We're kind of a mixture between the two. So we, I, I tend to call that FODAR. Um, that's, but the limitations, guys, um, they had to have this. We did a, did a pond here. They were resizing and repermitting that pond. Had to have it right now. They weren't too worried of the big drainage. Um, Camel going through here. They weren't too worried about the uh, vegetated areas. Obviously, see, we, this area, if I tell people if it's 100 degrees and you walk in, it's mosquito infested at 70 degrees, it's probably not going to work. Um, best time right now, obviously, the trees are gone. We're going to have a little bit better accuracy. Uh, what's nice about the software and the experience that we have, if I wanted to run brake lines or cross sections in there traditionally, I can take my UAV cloud, I can take my traditional survey points, I can put those two together. And now we have a nice comprehensive model. How are, I'm, and I've had a little experience in the photogrammetry world, but that was 20 years ago. Right. How do you, uh, how do you get around going from a five foot accurate to a one foot accurate and not have the aerial targets down there? Because you have to test five foot more targets out there to pick up that accuracy. Now, you, know, you would, the the, you would on an aircraft, yes. Okay. But we're limited to 400 feet. And, and what I, I'm sure there's probably people out there will, will uh, debate me on this, but I haven't really found now my, my ortho, my picture accuracies, my horizontal accuracies, that GSD get better as I come down. Now, when I generate that point cloud, I will see a huge difference between 100 feet and 400 feet. Because you honestly think, I mean, being an old school um, photographer, photogrammetry, I mean, there's a big difference between 1,000 feet and 5,000 feet. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, we're, we're limited to a shelf of very, does that make sense that my, my 100 feet versus 400 feet is not very big the relativity of that camera focal length as you would be from 1,000 feet to 5,000 feet. And that's where we're able to generate any kind of data. It would be you know, five foot contour to one foot contour. That and you know, a traditional photogrammetry, you're not producing a point cloud. Right. So now we have a point cloud. And as long as your point cloud is down at that centimeter accuracy, you're able to pull a centimeter measurements. Yeah. Yeah, and that was another question I had. I might have missed it. To get to the contours, if you're not running LIDAR, how are you coming up with those? I mean, are you saying there's a pulse shot? It's a camera. It's all done through photogram uh, photo stitching. That was kind of the process we went through. How this how this software came around, guys? Four or five years ago, Pix4D was almost thirty thousand dollars. You can believe that. They, uh, Pix4D drones weren't even in their thought process. And how we came up with this 3D modeling. Is, uh, you guys remember we sent the, uh, I can't remember the name of the rover, but we sent the rover to Mars and it was sending pictures back to NASA. Well, obviously NASA has a way bigger budget than any of us. So they got a hold of these guys and NASA wanted a 3D model, um, be able to, you know, pull that 3D model of Mars. So as that rover sending those pictures back, 
<laughs> this company came up with way above my pay grade and understanding how it all sticks together. Um, but they were able to 3D model Mars through the same techniques that we're using. Like I said, you know, four or five years ago, guys, fixed for needs like twenty, thirty thousand dollars, something ridiculous. I think it's around eighty five hundred at this point. So you can see you can see how far the technology's coming. Uh, any other questions? Uh, anyway, concerts guys be oh, good. I have not. I have not. Um, a funny story, we were in LA sitting with the you know vendors and every night and we were talking to uh, bag on EB a little bit. They had uh, their reps there and they were talking about how they're doing a demo in California and that you know sixty thousand dollar room is gone. Um, again guys, flyaways, in just my opinion, it can be really limited, guys. Calibrate your compass, inspect your drone, know how your firmware. Um, I don't update firmware when it comes out, I hold off. I wait, because you'll see things come down like, oh that's buggy, that's not working. Um, so personally, no. Um, I said the only the only time I've crashed a drone, ran the battery. I'll take full responsibility for that. And I've only had one scare. Um, at home built, we had we 3D print a lot of stuff, and my compass came loose, lost orientation, and I had to flip it to manual mode and bring it back in. But as I'm watching that flight plan that we showed a minute ago, that drone started drifting. And I was like, there's something wrong. And I hit the return of the home button. You know, we have our safety procedures. Hit return to home. But obviously, the compass is supposed to be facing north and it's facing this way. My home points totally not relative to where it used to be. So flipped it back to manual. But as far as flyaways, no, I have not experienced a flyaway. Um, the only other issue that we had, um, that Birdsboro job we did for Kiwit, and we flown it three times for them. We did the initial topo. Um, what they failed to mention to me that it was a, it was a hot spot. It had uh, radiation. We get out there and they have some, they have some areas marked off as red, um, but you know how the government is, what's an acceptable level of radiation? Uh, obviously the red areas are dangerous, but the whole site was a little bit active. Um, I had a partner help me fly that. We were over there on some concrete trying to take off and we were having all sorts of problems trying to take off. Compass problems, compass errors. And then again, if I don't feel comfortable with it, it's always better to bring it home and, and figure out what's going on. Don't just say, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll just keep a little bit further, a little bit further. Bring it home, guys. If it's out, bring it back. Um, but come to find out, for you guys that may do it, radiation affects your compass if <laughs> you take off. We had to move to the other end of the site, took off, launched, had an air problem. Um, answer your question? No, I, there's a lot of things. Um, miscommunication, I mean, it's electronics. And this electrical light, substation. What's that? An electrical substation. Substations, uh, another story on that. We did the PSO power plant. We'll show you the concert on that in a minute or a second. PSO power plant. Um, so on the Arkansas River, we're doing some erosion along the bank. We're sitting in the middle of the power plant. And at that time, I was running the fix off. My compass there was going crazy, would not take off. Uh, I called a buddy of mine and said, hey man, brainstorming. What I had to do was nice with the fix off. DJI, I've never done this. Fix off, I could go into the settings. Um, change my compass, say that the error is acceptable to, kind of like a GPS error when you're RT can. I changed the error to 10, something huge. Took off, got above the um, magnetic field, went back into my laptop, the data link, and changed the settings back to acceptable compass settings. I had to get out of that electronic field to, um, to be able to launch out of the PSX plane. So um, it's not using GPS data to navigate at all? Oh, definitely. It's in GPS. <coughs> yep. But if it's if, if the compass isn't working, then that's gonna don't don't take off. Figure out why, or I probably shouldn't have told that story. But you know, know your drone. That kind of goes back to know your drones. Knows what's kind of going on. Um, obviously, you know, you stick a magnet to a compass. That compass is gonna go crazy. So I need to get my compass, aka drone, and need to get it away from the magnet to be able to get my compass to settle back down. But until then, I had to trick the drone to think it was safe to take off. Uh, but I feel comfortable enough to fly in manual mode to get above me. So if something should happen, I can bring it back down. Um, for those who don't feel comfortable in manual mode, I would not suggest that at all. I go offside or not do the job. Um, but flyaways, guys, there's a million different scenarios. Um, despite what all these manufacturers tell you, drones are still new. They're still glitchy. They still have problems. It's not bulletproof. Um, I mean, you really think about it, I said four or five years ago we were building the stuff out of our, out of our garage to now we're getting turnkey stuff. So.
Yes, as long as the GPS is working. Now, if the GPS fails, you're losing your grid. You're losing your the, the drone is losing its its orientation. So, it, it, it basically, I'm trying to think of a better way to put this. Um, you know, just like driving with your Garmin or your iPhone. If I'm following the the step by step directions and that step by step directions go dead, and I'm not really paying attention to my surroundings, I have no idea where I'm at. Same thing with the drone. The GPS goes dead, it has no idea where it is on the map or in the sky. No, you can flip it to manual mode. You can flip it just like, you know, 20 years ago when people were building the RC planes, there was no such thing about GPS. Everything was done by skill level. Yeah. Right, and I don't know what product you have. I don't know. Like I said, the Pixhawk, um, DJI. I said they're a great product, um, biggest boy on the market. Um, but they're making it to, I say, call it dummy proof. I mean, anybody can pick it up and drive. Um, but if something bad or major should fail, you don't have that control like you would like a Pixhawk. I can do it completely manual and bring it back. As long as you know we don't have lose a prop or the the whole brain freaks out or something crazy major happens. So just the compass should fail. Should be able to bring that into a manual mode and land it safely. Definitely redundancies. You know, if you have two compasses on that one, we do, we do have redundancies on. And I, I recommend you guys that are um, buying your bigger drones. That's a lot of money, especially lidar. You know, typical lidar is about hundred thousand plus. So um, you don't want that crashing over one compass. Okay, Dave. For this particular project, was the vegetation too thick to have a... Oh, it was bad. You couldn't really walk through that. So you can't get enough data to... If the leaves were off, I could probably pull a little bit of data, um, but I still want to run checkpoints or spot points or even control points. Say, I, say the leaves were off and I ran that and I didn't really quite like the topo, I can, either, I can check the quality of this area by my checkpoints, and I can, or if I didn't like the, the results, I can use the checkpoints now as part of the model. To help um, tighten the model. Uh, anyway, keep it on here. Uh, we'll blow through this pretty fast. Okay. No. no. I mean, it's kind of like garage doors. It, yeah. It's one in, I don't want to say never, ever, but no. Never. Yep. That answers the question. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna go through this fast. AutoCAD guys, let's hit the, the, the slide shows a little blurry because of the uh, PowerPoint, but AutoCAD fits in really nice. Once you uh, create that ortho, it is geo referenced, it has that metadata. Um, we kind of go, we'll go over that in training to different AutoCAD versions, how to bring in this ortho, um, bring it to the right scale, the right accuracy. Uh, main farm with Cushing, um, quick uh, Phil 66, the engineer was uh, a little skeptical of our accuracy. You kind of see the traditional points that we shot for a brake line. We gave them that data, we flew the job. Um, everything matched up really nice. Uh, but it played, it played well with AutoCAD. Uh, 10, uh, 10 is a great way to check. Um, quick story, see around the tank, there's a berm. Um, these these uh, berms need to be repermitted every time they either, um, anytime they mess with the berm, they need to repermit, they need to repermit it every so many years. Uh, so they had a previous topo, and my volume numbers and containment, my containment numbers were not matching the previous numbers. Um, of course, you know, the engineer called me, I'm a little concerned. I'm looking things over. I uh, got, finally got a hold of the original survey, and they, they, they took the tank out, but they did not incorporate that gravel berm around the, uh, around the tank. And that kind of goes back to guys, we're collecting everything out there. We're not just collecting on your brake line experience, if you will, or running the grid. Uh, Plays nice with AutoCAD, contours. We do the subdivision. You see the line where it fits in nice, the ortho fits really nice. Um, especially for your client, great marketing tool. Um, play, we can create anything with KMZ we want. Um, PSO power plant, you can see the uh, contours that we created there on the, uh, on the bank. Um, back to KMZs, we can create KMZs, we can update Google Earth. Um, I mean, obviously, no, Google Earth doesn't update all the time, especially on new construction sites. Um, everybody run. Everybody runs Google Earth pretty much anymore. A lot of my clients, I'm sure typically here, some people in your office 
don't know how to run AutoCAD, but everybody can pretty much run Auto Google Earth. So this makes a great tool just to send it over to say, hey, this is the project, take a look at it. We can layer KMZ files. Um, obviously update the imagery on KMZ, click the other KMZ, and now we have um, contour over the top of it. And say for you engineers out there, you've designed your work, uh, keep it safe line forward, just keeping the course of the <laughs> surveyor gives it to you. If you give me your design work, your line work, I can create your design and create a KMZ and overlay, uh, which really makes a nice, kind of goes back to that um, rural water district. We had an original topo on many KMZ. Uh, we had the des engineer design in many KMZ, and obviously we made our mapping as built, so I layered that up, and that kind of goes back to you. You can see the progression of where the pond should have been versus what was actually an as built out. Uh, we're running out of time here. About what, 30 more minutes? This end at 11.30? Okay, yeah, we're uh, Something I'm gonna add new to this uh, lecture is hardware and uh, software. I'm gonna go blow through some of this stuff pretty quick here. Um, we're gonna go through some mapping apps, stitching software, some GIS software, and then new hardware. You know, uh, I'll talk about some uh, GPS stuff that's coming out that's gonna really hopefully help our industry in bringing that GPS price down for us. Um, mapping apps. This is going to tell you how to run that grid. Uh, we're going to go through the two big boys on the market. Um, <clears throat> drone deploy. Uh, I don't recommend drone deploy, guys, for professional purposes. Um, if you guys want to go out there and play and don't really want to get serious about it, drone deploy is great. You're very user friendly. Um, Cloud based processing. Um, there's two companies that I know that you can actually map with the drone, send them the photos, and they'll process in the cloud. Um, multiple battery missions. When you're looking at your uh, Mapping apps, um, some are limited to, say you have 100 acres, and it's going to take three batteries to fly that 100 acres. Um, you don't have to set up every battery set up as a job. You don't have to split that job, 100 acres up into three jobs. You can leave it as one job, battery runs out, comes back, swap it out, goes back to wherever it, it uh, wherever the battery ran out previously. Uh, the deer and the bleak, um, we mainly run the deer in my office, um, just because we're interested in mapping and topo work. Um, for you guys, definitions in the deer, your camera's going to be facing 90 degrees or perpendicular or uh, parallel with the, with the ground. Um, oblique, we're going to turn that camera just a little bit, maybe a 45 degree angle or 70 degree angle. And now I'm filling in my 3D models. Um, say we're mapping this building, I would point cloud the top of the building and point cloud the ground, but I wouldn't be able to point cloud the sides very well. If I'm running oblique angles, I'm going to fill in the complete model. Uh, I kind of like to glitch you guys. Uh, I'm the type of person, if I'm going to drive or fly somewhere to do a job, I want to be able to do a job and come home. I don't want to sit out there and, and uh, have problems with, with the process. And that's where my, my big hang up on drone deploy is because it's not very dependable for what I do. Apple, Android, or some both, I uh, put one dollar sign because it does cost money to do it. Um, Pix4D Capture. I want Pix4D Capture, and then again, these are the two. two Manufacturers that actually fly the drone, collect the drone, and process your data. A mapping app, it does the cloud based processing. You can uh, upload your picture to the cloud. Um, double grid, what's nice about the double grid, uh, uh, Pix4D Capture does really a good job about doing those obliques of 3D models. Um, just for quick reference, say you fly your drone north and south, the double grid, once it's done, it'll go east and west. That's basically what it does. Uh, single battery, I wish Pix4D, Pix4D would change this. I might change my mind about using it more. Um, I hate resetting at my job every time. I want to be able to just fly, change a battery, kick it back up. Yes, sir. Uh, I will check it. I'm pretty sure. But I'll, I'll double check on that. So they said. Right. It goes right back to where it left off. I'll have to give that a try because. Honestly, I've only used Pix4D for that one time. Um, that, that was my biggest, at that point in that time, that was my biggest no. I'm, I'm looking for something else. Because um, I'm, I'm traditionally used to running PixHop, which PixHop, we'll get into a minute, is awesome and great. Um, just a little bit of learning curve, but with the uh, DJI Phantoms, I'm not able to run PixHop, the mission plan. Um, point of interest. Um, point of interest, guys, they're, I'm not aware of any app that does vertical mapping at this point. Um, say we want to do a, a shelf or a cliff, we need to run that drone just like we would do horizontal with side labs. Now we need to run 
at different altitudes with different laps to get that shell. I'm not sure. A, a friend of mine, Andy Trench, the exact fence again, is uh, working on some uh, some software to do that. Uh, point of interest, basically, the flagpole. I'm telling the drone the top of the flagpole. Now I can pick a radius point, and it's going to orbit around the, uh, the flagpole, and I get a 3D object with that flagpole. So be very aware between point of interest versus vertical mapping. There's a big difference. Uh, supports TCPs. I said kind of. If it's not user friendly, like drone deploy, you can actually go in there and pick your TCPs. What happens is, is you upload your photos to the cloud, you download your ortho, <coughs> you download your cloud. Now they want you to dump that into their desktop, um, which costs money um, to be able to add your GCPs to get that centimeter accuracy. Apple, Android, and it's a free app. Um, DJI GS Pro just came out. I got a chance to really play with it, do some research on it, talk to some people about it. Um, I personally would, like, I'll get to my uh, mapping app, but just want you guys to be aware of that there. Um, POI, that's the uh, point of interest again. Waypoint, they do have the waypoints in this. The other programs, uh, I don't believe have waypoints in them, but um, waypoints are basically just traverse points, guys. <clears throat> Obviously, we want to fly that lawnmower path, but if we just want to do a three simple mission, go 100 feet here, 100 feet there, I can just pick those coordinates and it'll just do that. Go to those three points of interest. Uh, virtual fence, <clears throat> they do, did add a virtual fence, say you're doing 100 by 100 area uh, mapping, and you set your, vir uh, your virtual fence 150 by 150. You set your fence just a little bit bigger than with your project area. If something should happen, as long as the GPS is working, it won't leave that vertical fence. Even if you're not mapping, I do believe that if you're even just flying through the waypoints and you take over the sticks, as long as you're in the app, it won't leave that uh, virtual fence. Very new, still a little bit glitchy. Every yes. I'm that one. You can fly and slow down, stop, take a picture, fly, stop. Um, I don't know if this one will stop and take a picture. If you're wanting to do that, yeah. Leachy is the best to do that kind of work. This one will do that? Okay. That's the, the, we say the, the waypoints, so if you get a waypoint one, stop, take a picture, waypoint two, stop, and take a picture. Um, if I'm going to do that kind of work, um, Leachy does, I think, does an awesome job. You can set the, you know, decline or incline to waypoint to waypoint, do an orbit. It's a lot of cool features to Leachy. I think I'm saying that right. Um, it's a dot of mapping out there, guys. Uh, then again, I put glitching in a lot of this stuff because a lot of stuff crashes. Uh, then again, guys, if you hear that, oh, this, this, this product works great, it never fails, uh, I'd walk away. This guy's, this guy's is still really, really new. Stuff happens. Um, Apple, learn on that one, it's a free program. Uh, Matt Pilot, this is what I use quite a bit on my uh, Phantom. Uh, multiple, multiple battery. It only does it near. Like I said, I'm, I'm not really interested in the bleak. Um, terrain awareness, what's really nice about this, guys, remember the overlaps or photos. Um, say we're mapping a mountain. Uh, I'm going to launch from a high point and map the whole thing. But as I go over and my altitude changes, my overlaps are going to change. So what, uh, what the terrain awareness does, it's going to keep a constant 100 feet of whatever the, uh, the topography of the land is. So my, my pictures, I get a better map. Um, back in the early days, we didn't have this, so what I just used to tell people is that um, please launch from the highest point, um, keep your overlaps high. By the time you get to the low points of your project, your overlaps are going to be greater. So, um, anyway, this training awareness, uh, linear flight planning corridor work. Um, I've only missed this a couple times. Um, I'm not, I don't like it. I'll break it up into smaller projects and fly it. Um, that being said, all these apps that I'm that I've talked about so far do rectangular um, boundaries. They do not do irregular boundaries very well. Um, so especially Matt Pilot, uh, all the apps that I've talked about so far, if you have an irregular shape piece of property, you're gonna have success. You can either burn a bunch of batteries and cover way more than you need, or you can have little multiple missions to cover the, the project area. Um, pretty easy to use, Apple, and it does cost a little bit of money, it's not too bad. Um, but, be aware when you buy the app, you have to buy a little, not too much more money, but you have to spend a little bit more for the terrain awareness um, option. It's not an inclusive package. Uh, mission Planner. Now we're getting, I'll talk about the, uh, the big boys on the block, if you will. Uh, mission Planner only works with 3DR. I wish it would, would work with DJI because I would definitely use it. Um, I've really open source, guys. 
Uh, for those who don't know, open source is not a proprietary software. Um, the reason it's really steady is that say I go out and something should happen, I can actually write code. I can get into the code. Um, what I tell people, DJI is kind of like Apple. Uh, for you guys that have iPhones, you go to an iPhone store, they really don't care. They're not going to tell you how to crack it. They're not going to let you get into the programming. They're going to sell you another Apple phone. Same thing with DJI. They're very, very hard to crack into um, the brain and the operation of the system. Pixhop, um, the open source, if something happen, anybody can write code or send in the 3D R, it's constantly updated. That being said, say a couple versions behind. Don't get all excited and update every time you get the chance. Uh, lots of options, guys, not only for mapping, but for, uh, for flying as well. You can go in there, this is completely customizable. Um, we can set up geo fences, we can set up redundancies, we can set up the controller. Um, it's a really powerful program. Um, we can upload files. All the other apps say we wanted a, a, a new KMZ file or a new photo imagery or a new DTM. We have a, a current topo that we did on the property. I can upload that into the mission planner and it will recognize it. Um, that being said, too, has a great, down, great pull down menu for like uh, Google Earth, Bing, a lot of different mapping on it, but different background maps that you can run as background. Only well, runs off a laptop, no smartphone dev uh, device, and it's free to download. If you guys want to play with it, get one 3 website and download the Mission Planner and um, welcome to play around with it. Uh, UGCS uh, hasn't been on the market very much. I haven't got to play with it, did a lot of reading on it. Um, I haven't played with it because it's a lot of money. So if they would give me a demo to play and I like it, I'd buy it, but I'm happy for what I'm doing. I'm not going to spend the money. Um, UGCS I like what I see other than the laptop and the smartphone. You have to have a laptop and it works through your smart, smartphone. smart device. It's not just laptop only, it's not just uh, tablet only. It, they have to interact and talk together. It's, it's, I don't want to downplay them because it is a good software, but it's, it's a little bit of a learning curve, a little bit more complicated. But it does some great things. Um, there's a lot of cool options that say you need more than just running that lawnmower path or doing a point of interest. To, you want to do waypoints, spin, take pictures, all sorts of crazy stuff. So this is a good app to look into. Uh, okay, so that's the mapping app. Let's get the mapping app. So how are we going to stitch the programs? We're going to talk about three stitching programs. Uh, Pix4D, uh, easy to use. They made it very user friendly. Um, supports multiple coordinate systems. Um, if you use Agile software we'll in a minute, a minute, they want decimal degrees of Latin long. Um, so we have to convert all the coordinate systems to all our GCPs to decimal degrees Latin long to be able to, uh, to be able to import the CSV file for the GCPs. Um, what's really nice about Pix4D, you can actually change the X and Y or Y and X. Um, you can put CSV files, you can put space plate coordinates. It plays well with a lot of coordinate systems. Uh, it's the most popular, and what's nice about the uh, Pix4D as if you don't want to think about an $8,500 program. I haven't checked on the, the full license price in a while. Um, but if you don't want to pay that, say you have one job this month, uh, it's about 350 bucks for the month of rent. Um, so you want to save up three or four jobs, skip a month, and process them all at one time. It kind of makes it nice and easy to budget that 350 a month, other than uh, $8,500. Um, does cost the most money. It is a little pricey. Uh, the second most popular is Agisoft. Photo scan, a little bit of learning curve, um, but it's a really nice program. Um, I've messed with Agisoft a little bit. Uh, I'm going to dive into it more. I think I'm going to lean to it a, a little bit more than uh, Pix4D, just because it's uh, a lot more options. Uh, Pix4D is user friendly, um, but it's really limited to, say, 10 options versus Agisoft may have 50 options to, to be able to process your data. No monthly rental, I think it runs about $3,500, $4,500 to buy this program. Um, support is pretty limited. Um, going back to Pix4D, and if you hit YouTube, there's tons of videos on YouTube to learn Pix4D. Um, go to their website, they've done a great job as far as making it user friendly, making the product. Um, Pix4D has lots of tech support. Um, Agisoft, a lot of old videos, <laughs> I mean, from three years ago, and they've changed the interface a little bit. Um, so be prepared to learn this and kind of wade through it a little bit. Um, for those who want to do the training, um, online training with us, I'll have this figured out and have lots of videos where you don't have to learn, you just pull up the video and watch. We'll have Agisoft figured out for you. Uh, so it's one dollar sign, it's a little bit of money. Um, last, last but not least, Context Capture. It's a Bentley program. I don't know if anybody using Bentley software here currently. It plays well with Bentley. It doesn't play well with others very well. Um, 
I haven't had to play with it. I finally got a demo from the guys uh, I'm going to start playing with. Uh, we know a colleague down in uh, Philadelphia, Chris Gorney. Um, great guy, great 3D guys. If you go on his um, uh, Bentley site, he's doing a great video. They're doing some pretty awesome stuff with it. Uh, the one thing I do like about it, he uh, does have a little bit of learning curve. It's not as user friendly as Pix4D. Probably the same learning curve with that. So. Great 3D graphics. Uh, for you gamers out there or see your kids or grandkids play, you know, PlayStation 4 graphic games, when you stitch your 3D models, it looks just like the real deal out there in the field. It does a great job for 3D models. Um, it does great wire meshing, but I do believe, can quote me this, I do believe you can't export the wire mesh. It does export the family software, but it does not ex export to uh, like 3D, still uh, 3D in your AutoCAD. And it is very pricey. I believe you have to buy the whole package. You can't just pick and choose what package you want from uh, their drone uh, stitching software. Um, anyway, that's the, uh, the stitching. So we've gone through mapping, collecting the data, collecting the photos. Photos, now we stitch the photos. Now we have a point cloud in Norco. From there, uh, now we, uh, surveyors, we dabble in GIS all the time. Uh, I remember in my younger years, like, oh, I, used, I learned the definition, it's a passive test, I'm never going to do GIS. Uh, now here we are, we're, right, we're walking on their toes every day. Um, for, for anybody young out there in the audience, uh, GIS is going to be a great career. It's, it's how the whole world's going to operate, honestly. Anyway, we're going to go through uh, probably, I know there's lots of GIS applications out there. You've got Esri, uh, RCAD, RGIS, um, those are big boys on the block. Um, but I'm going to talk about in the drone world what's pretty popular amongst the uh, us droners, if you will. So anyway, um, free. Let's talk about the free software. Say you send a point cloud or an image or any kind of data to a client, and they want to be able to view or spin that point cloud or make a movie or something of that nature. Um, you don't want to go spend you know thousand or twenty thousand dollars to view that. These guys, these these two softwares, Cloud Compare and MeshLab, are very free. Uh, download them, open source, uh, great to view point clouds, limited tools. I like, to, uh, I like that word free, guys. It's, it's really nice to kind of just play around with stuff. Uh, QGIS, it's open source, it's free as well. Um, what's cool about G, uh, QGIS, it's really beginner GIS software. It has more options than the cloud compare of the mesh lab, but still very limited because it is free. Um, very large community to support, which is really nice. You can get on the Facebook sites, um, blogs. A lot of people talking, a lot of buzz about this QGIS at this point. Um, not only does it support point clouds, but it also supports your uh, imagery. And then again, guys, that word I really love is free. Uh, global Mapper. I'm a big Global Mapper um, advocate. Uh, I've been running Global Mapper for a long time. Um, global Mapper is a really powerful program, guys. If you don't have this in your toolbox, I suggest you guys get this. It's uh, $500 for the basic package for Global Mapper and other five hundred is about thousand dollars, twelve hundred dollars. You get the lidar module. Um, their new version, I believe, is nineteen. Um, they've, they've come a long way in the lidar field. Um, we're eventually going to be getting into uh, classifying and contours. Uh, it does classify right now, um, but I don't really, as a surveyor, if I'm wanting to run quick contours and dirty contours, um, I, I would definitely use Global Mapper. If I'm wanting to turn it into a client design. I wouldn't use those at this point. Uh, low cost, like I said, a thousand bucks for the whole program. Can't beat that for GIS software. Does anybody that ever priced Esri, um, you gotta take a loan on that stuff, guys. Costly. Um, I use it mainly to open and convert any file format that I want. Um, when we when we stitch the software, it comes out as a GeoTIFF file. And those of you who use GeoTIFF files, those things are huge. They'll crash your computer. So I'll take it, Global Mapper works great. I can convert it to an ECW, which works great with Civil 3D. I can convert it to a JPEG. I can dumb its size down. I can load point files, turn it to an LAS file, PTLY file, XYZ file. Um, another thing about converting coordinate systems, you know, <clears throat> say I did something to state plane coordinates, and all of a sudden my client wants UTM. So point of pain in the butt, right? No, jump it in Global Mapper, pull down the configuration tab, Change it to whatever UTM zone that you're in, hit apply, convert it all over for you, export the cloud, send it to your client or your image, and now it's all in UTM coordinates. Uh, it does do some line work, it is a GIS program. Um, I'm just talking about the, the drone aspects of it, um, but for you GISers out there, um, it does a lot of information for, especially for $1,000. Honestly, they could probably charge way more money for this, but we won't tell them. 
when you convert from, uh, you said from the field chip to uh, off chip radiation, what file? ECW. ECW? Right, if you dump a JPEG into an AutoCAD file right now, it'll uh, it'll lag your computer. So you pan or you want to zoom, it'll have that lag. ECW, the, the new Civil 3D software, changed the format that uses, old days you had to convert it to JPEG or a, or a bitmap, BMP file. The, uh, the Civil 3D now has the GIS software, so now that it supports the ECWs. And you saw my uh, alpha surveys where we convert those ECWs. I can work fast. Just as fast as my fingers will work, that photo will keep up with me in the ECW. E e EC, uh, Edward Cat Walter. I'm not a military guy. <laughs> For all you guys online, give me a hard time about it. Anyway, uh, new innovations, guys. I'm excited about this because I'm, I'm tired of spending ten thousand to thirty thousand dollars on GPS. Um, so th this stuff is really going to help, hopefully, the whole industry. Uh, kind of going back to talking about turning your drone into PPK or RTK. Um, this is how it's happening. Um, this is the uh, Emily. Uh, it's running for about. I'm getting my prices all confused. I think you can buy. You can buy the whole system, this whole kit, L1, L2 kit, for um, $2,500. So kind of wrap your brain around that. Obviously, the radios are limited. We're not going to run, you know, four miles or two miles. But for half a mile to a mile, I'm pretty impressed with the $2,500 price tag. Uh, on the left, you can tell they turned the base of the rover. Uh, obviously, the Bugatti. You can buy the kit. Um, a lot of great um, support on how to set up, set up your own homemade uh, rover base. Obviously, if you want something a little bit nicer, these heads run about $1,800. Um, if you want to run, turn your uh, drone into a PPK and RTK station. Um, it's, that way you're getting that centimeter accuracy off the photo, which I'll go over there in just a second. Um, you can connect this. Obviously, it runs to the Pixhawk. Like I said, the DJI, you're taking pictures. Hook in another sensor. That's all you can do. Pixhawk, if you really want to broaden your, your, uh, your business, Pixhawk, Pixhawk 2 came out. Um, is where you go. But anyway, you see the GPS pub, see the radio talking, and this is how it converts it into TikTok. So like I said, twenty five hundred dollars. Um, I'm hoping as the popularity grows, hopefully somebody online's listening. Popularity I'd love to talk to Emily, um, have talk to a rep and do a demo and do some accuracy checks with her. Like I said, I'm excited guys. I'm really excited because like I said, you know, GPS has been uh, killing us for a long time. Uh, another GPS that's kind of coming on the market right now, uh, the VMAP systems. Um, you can tell there's a good setup right here. You can see the uh, the GPS receiver on top and how it integrates into the the camera. Basically, right now, when you just take a single camera without the system on it, it just takes that internal GPS, um, either with internal camera GPS or internal GPS with the drone, which we have that meter. So when we geotag those pictures, now we're meter accuracy. So now we hook this up to it. We time the shutter speed. Um, a little bit, of, a little bit of learning if you want to build this yourself. Now, when we take the picture, now we're down to centimeter accuracy. And obviously, you can see a picture here where they turned into a base in the rover out there collecting points. Um, if you guys are digging in and talking to people, be aware of surveyors of PPK. We know the difference between PPK and RTK. The general public does not. They like to say RTK because that's the, the fancy word and that's what everybody wants. But if you really get into it, there's still a lot of post-processing. With this newer stuff, but as far as setting GCPs coming along, uh, like I said I'm, I'm excited. Hopefully, we'll drive that cost down and these and build your boys out here. Uh, I know most of the surveyors have their own equipment, but for those out there who don't have equipment for GCPs, um, AeroPoints is pretty cool. We got to meet these guys in Vegas a couple of years um, when they first started out. I like their idea. Obviously, I have my own equipment, so I don't need to buy the panels. But for those people who don't have, uh, don't want to go spend that kind of money. You can buy these panels. Um, they act like a target, and they actually set a point, turn the thing on, and it's just like we used to run static. Um, they have to, you have to have their network and have an app. It's app driven. Once it's collected, you can download it to their app, process it, and you'll have coordinates time to get back to the to the uh, office. Well, solar panel. It's pretty cool. Um, they they say the battery will never run out. I mean, obviously we're going to map on nice days. It's sitting out there, so it's constantly recharging itself. So basically, take your pile of panels, stick them in the corner. Um, I can see an application, people are running a lot of volume work, um, stockpiles and stuff like that that don't have a, a big budget. Throw these panels out, do your stockpiles, pick them up and go home. 
I think you know, I thought it was pretty cool content. Kind of, kind of give you guys an idea of where uh, where the technology is driving. All right, LiDAR. Um, I put exact sense because we uh, kind of partnered up with uh, Andy over there, and I like what he's doing. He's one of the pioneers in the LiDAR um, at this point for drones. It's been doing quite a while. Anyway, the most popular puck right now is Valentine. It's really small. They've got it down to pretty lightweight. Um, 32 lasers. You can see 7,000 points. Um, 16 lasers, 300,000 points. Um, depending on what laser you have, obviously data and accuracy has to come down. Um, kind of answer his question. It's, it's heavy, guys. It's 10 to 12 pounds. Um, for you to go out there and map 100 acres or more, I wouldn't suggest it. I really wouldn't. Um, and the problem with that is your flight times is uh, the heavier the product, kind of going back to Jim real quick, the heavier the product, the less the flight times. Obviously, we can build a bigger drone to carry that. The flight times will go up. But what's happening with the smaller um, LiDAR putts is we're losing the returns. You have to fly about 150 feet or less. So if you can imagine your cone with, as you're collecting data, obviously the, the higher you go, the bigger your cone is. Um, the lower you are, the bigger your swap and your collection is coming. So if I'm at 150 feet in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and that's, that's, you're collecting a lot of, you're not collecting a lot of data for the time at that point, if that answers. So if you guys are out there trying to buy LiDAR at this point, I really would hold back. Um, there's a company that I know spent about $150,000, and it's about eight, no, eight to months to a year later, they're still not running, they're still sitting in their office. Um, so really be aware of the LiDAR. I'm not discouraging anybody, I'm just telling you the pros and cons out there. Uh, especially the salesmen, they'll sell you, you know, anything you can imagine, they'll answer the questions for you, but in reality, uh, bridge inspections, cell phone towers, small plots, um, buildings, something small, think small. If you're starting to do acreage, you're, you're really kind of just wasting your money at that point. Anyway, one thing we get a lot of questions about is uh, will the FODAR pick up wires for wire inspection sagging and all that? It will not. You have to have LIDARs to do wire inspection for anybody that you may, may do those in here. Uh, like I said, small features. Um, uh, got a picture. Yeah, okay. This is that bird back there. What's nice about that when we were selling them is that we wanted you to get used to the bird. Um, if you so happen to crash, you lose a camera and not a you know, $100,000 plus GPS sitting on the bottom of it. Once you were able to familiarize yourself, get used to the drone, this is a plug and play on the bottom of that big drone back there. Uh, but what's nice about this LiDAR unit, guys, kind of going back to the color point cloud, um, you can definitely run just the LiDAR cloud, but you can get that RGB color look to it, and you won't get an ortho photo. If we're running the dual camera and the LiDAR puck at the same time, we're able to get that color point cloud, and we're able to get that ortho photo out of it at the same time. Uh, any questions on LiDAR so far? All right, some examples of LiDAR. Very small unit, guys. Very, very, just think small when you think LiDAR at this point, especially for the money tag. I said, I hate for you guys to go out there and spend hundreds of two hundred thousand dollars and be very disappointed. It's a very, very pricey tag to be disappointed. Uh, can't remember what I put here. Maybe not. Okay, anyway, that's the end of my presentation. Um, I appreciate your time. It's a very honor for you guys to be asking me back for the second time to talk to you guys. Uh, we are going to do air topo training, guys. Um, be aware, I'm going to hope happily, hopefully have it up in less than 60 days. Um, the price tag is going to be pretty cheap. It's going to be three to $500 to start out for a membership. Obviously, as the popularity grows and as we get PDAs and um, Incorporated, that price is eventually going to go up. But I really believe that there's nothing out there online right now with this competition <laughs> training that we just talked about. So I really believe it's going to take off. Um, but we're going to break it down, like I said, small videos, 15 to 10 minutes max, and you'll be able to go through your library. If you have a particular problem, go to that library, find that video for, to your, for your particular problem. We're also going to create a private face group. So once you, once you sign up for the membership, We'll add you to that face group site, and hopefully as a community, you guys can help each other out, and then obviously our staff will come in there and answer those questions as they pop up. Um, so any questions over uh, drones, surveying, or anything like that?